Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church.
And it's like he just swoops you into his loving arms. Wow, you guys. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks, God. One of my friends wrote a song that says, God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. Thanks, God, for not just reaching down and pulling us up to yell at us and point your finger and tell us all the things that we did wrong and get us into the circumstance that we're in, but you reach down and you just pull us up and in one swift motion, here comes the hand and spread from the hand into the arms, into that warm, loving embrace. It's just I don't know, it's just, you know, it's just that warm, thanks God, thanks God for hugging us, thanks God for loving us, for picking us up, picking up all of our pieces, and not being mad or upset or disappointed, but loving us through it.
teach you something. The Bible talks about how it says, when one or two are gathered together, I will be there. In other words, when you show up and worship God, whether it's one of you, whether it's 20 of you, whether it's 50 of you or 200, it just if you just show up expecting God to move and you show up worshiping God, the Bible says he inhabits the praises of his people. So he lives in the praises of his people. A lot of people haven't experienced God because they've not worshiped God. They've not praised God. But I promise you, if you begin to praise God, if you begin to worship God, that's why God can show up in your car. That's why God can show up when you're mowing your yard. That's why God can show up when you're getting ready in the morning in your bathroom. Why is God in my bathroom? I tell, I'll tell you why he is. Because he says, I live in the praises of my people. If you're praising me, that sounds good to me. That smells good to me. I want to go where I feel welcome. I want to go where people are talking about me. I want to go where people are worshiping me. So it doesn't matter if it's in the middle of South Omaha, in the middle of a, of a, of a winter snowstorm. If you show up and worship, Because, as you know, it just will slowly make its way through the house. 
and there's five of us, so it lasts a long time. And uh, so far, so good. It's not, it's not paid me. Um, matter of fact, that's, that's Ashley's mom right there. She looks so pretty today. Um, and uh, so Ashley was on a homesick, and she sent me a text message. She goes, I just gave up. I said, you, <laughs> yeah, you stay there, I'll stay here. Uh, looks like I'm coming home with you guys today. I'm not going home. I won't preach long, I won't teach long, but I gotta teach you something. Um, I wanted to bring this last week. Like I'm sitting down, like trying to act all calm and collected, uh, but I know that's gonna change really soon. We had a, a minister's luncheon yesterday uh, uh, for the region. We all got together and something that we do every year, which ironically enough, it's been a year since my family got sick because we got sick at the Christmas party last year. Uh, and so it's been a whole year, so th- apparently this is how it, how it works. Um, but uh, they said, hey, are you prepared to pray the benediction? And uh, so I don't know what prepared means. Um, am, I, am I ready to pray? Yeah, I'm ready to pray. The Bible says that we need to be instant, in season, and out of season. Like, you always need to be ready to, to do what you got to do. I'm like, sure. And I told Ashley last day, I said, I don't, I don't plan to do this, but I'm all cool, calm, and collected, just hanging out, drinking some eggnog. Eggnog is amazing. Eggnog is a gift from the gods. I'm telling you what, man. And if you get it to the, the right coldness, it is just, I think it's full of sugar, but it's totally worth it. Um, but um, just sitting there enjoying it, and they said, Brad, come up and pray. I said, sure, I'll go up and pray. And I grabbed that microphone, and I closed my eyes, and there's like a switch that just came on, and all of a sudden, uh, I was ready to preach. And so I'm here, I'm calm, I'm sitting down, we'll see how far I can get with this. Uh, sitting down, I don't think very far. I, I know, listen, I know what God has put into this church. And if you are a member of this church, I know what God has put into you. Um, I'll prophesy right now. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God has put something in you. And perhaps you've not seen it yet. I've been, pe- I've been preaching this for the last several weeks now. Matter of fact, I feel like I've been teaching this and preaching this since June. I, I feel like all of my messages... I feel like all of my messages have, have could be like a six-month series. Time out. It's really funny. I don't have one praise and worship team member in here. I'm right because here. They all have to, except right Sean. Here. Oh, it's Shannon. They're all going to come back for the 11 o'clock. <laughs> you guys. Um, you don't want double the dosage? Mickey's going to get double, so it's fine. But uh, um, I know what he's – I know. I feel like since June, all of my messages could go together. And I know what the Lord has told me. I know what the Lord has told me. At the beginning of creation, I preached this a couple weeks ago, if you didn't catch it. At the beginning of creation, when God was creating the heavens and the earth, he said, he said, I have put everything in this earth that this earth needs to operate. Every seed I've planted, every shrub is there, every herb is there. He said, I've given you this earth, us, I've given you guys everything that you need to be fruitful and to multiply and to make it through life. But then he goes on to say, but I've not yet caused it to rain because there's nobody to till the ground. God has put into this church. My grandpa, about 55 years ago, went out here. There's pictures. Went out here and, 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 and put a shovel into the dirt. There's literally pictures of him shoveling our foundation out to build this church. And uh, I believe 55 years ago, God put into this church um, of everything that this church needs to be effective, to, to be efficient, to be dynamic. To be uh, um, to for God to show off. I mean, everything that we need need to do to be something. He said, "I planted this at the beginning of the creation of this church and of this ministry." But I want to say now today that we've not seen all of that. Why haven't we seen that? Uh oh, standing up. Um, why haven't we seen it? How come my dad said, I remember I was probably 18 years old, and I remember he was taking me to work for whatever reason. Perhaps my my car wasn't working, but I remember exactly where we were. And my dad told me, he said, there's going to come a time where the real name is really going to mean something, where our church is going to be spectacular, where it's going to be dynamic, it's going to reach the lost, and it's going to really make an impact. Now, I know that our church has, and I know that this ministry has, but how come it's not bigger? How come it's not more effective? How come, you know, how come it's not packed out? How come we're not at a new facility? How come we've been limited on our growth? And I would say this even if my father was sitting in this place. I believe it's because there's no one to till the ground. He said, I've given you everything that you need, South of the whole Church of God, to grow and to prosper, but there's nobody to manage the harvest. 
God doesn't rain on what you wish. God doesn't grow what you want. God doesn't bless you with the things that you dream about. God gives you what you can manage. Sean, can you turn me down a little bit, buddy? God gives you what you can manage. People have these vision boards, you know, they, you know, and, and, and they, they just so they, they they just work so hard to have these things in their life, and they're fasting and they're praying for them. But the fact of the matter is this: you can do that all you want. Now, I know that God is a gracious God, but God doesn't give you what you dream for, what you want, what you beg for, what you fast for. God gives you what you can manage. It's probably a reason why this church is not a 200-member church or a 100-member church or a 300-member church. There's probably a reason why we're not at another facility. And I believe it's because God is not to the level yet where he says, I can reign on your seed. And I believe that that's also inside of you guys today. Inside of you, God has given you everything that you need to make something with yourself. Inside of you today, at the beginning of creation, the word of God says that you are fearfully made. You are made in his image. You are made with a purpose. One day, God said, I need a Kevin voice, and he made a Kevin voice purposefully. It's not an accident. You're never an accident. He made you, and not only did he make you purposefully, but then he made you for a purpose. There is a purpose for us. He, and at that beginning of creation, he put everything inside of you in order for you to be fruitful, in order for you to multiply, but you've not seen it because he's not rained on it because he said, if I rain on what I put inside of you, you're not capable of managing what will come out. So all of a sudden, when we start coming into church, and I've seen this with Jordan, I've seen this with Jordan, all of a sudden, and I told him this, when you start coming to church, God says, okay, I'm starting to see a different degree of management. I'm starting to see how you're becoming a little bit more disciplined. You're, you're taking serious, you're getting more serious about what I put inside of you. And all of a sudden, we get, we get serious with our prayer time. Our prayer time. You get serious in worship. You're raising your hands. You're getting more serious with your giving. And God said, okay, I'm starting to see a different degree of management. I'm starting to see how you're taking this a little bit more serious. And then he begins to kind of rain on what's inside of you. And before long, these what was planted inside starts to come out. I believe that in my years that I've been here, I've been here all of my life, and I've been serving, actively serving in this church since, um, well, my gosh, I started playing the drums in this church down here on the floor when I think I was in seventh grade. So I've been active, and somehow, some way, in this church in seventh grade. How are you, 12, 11? Since seventh grade, I'm 35. I'll be 36 this month. So for, for, for the bulk of my life, I've served in this church, and I believe that God is continuing to reign on my seed, and I believe that I've not seen my complete harvest yet. Why? Because there, there's levels, and there's, there's de degrees of management. I can manage what I have right here, and I can manage what I have more and more of what I have right here, but, but the Lord is still trying to uh, uh, discipline me and grow me and develop me so he can give me more. What we've got to do is we've got to get to an, an, an area of our life to the level of of our life where God feels it's okay for him to reign on the seeds that he's planted. I talked about how, and I, I think I referred to this a lot last week, that, that if, if God can't, it's a Bible, it's a Bible verse, I don't know where it's at, I can find it for you, but, but if God can't trust you with the little, God's never going to give you more. People want more and more and more, but God can't trust you with the little. So I've been teaching this principle, and I'm going to fly through this message in 20 minutes, but I've been teaching about management. I know that in order for us to see what God has in store for this church, we need to prove to him that we are capable of managing the harvest. And so last two weeks ago, I went down a, a, a slippery slope, and I began to teach about the management of our resources, money. People don't want to talk about money. People don't want to hear about money. All of a sudden, when the pastor starts to think, talk about money, there's something inside of your head right now, and you need to turn it off. And I'm talking about, I'm talking about how this is going to help you. This ain't for me. I was telling Adam a couple of days ago, well, I'll back up. I'll tell you what. I, I asked the Lord. I said, Lord, how come people are so weird when it comes to talking about money in the church? I mean, when we talk about money in the workplace, when we talk about money outside of these walls, it's never an issue. All of a sudden, we get into the church, we start talking about money, tithe, and offering, and people get weird about it. And he told me two clear things. He said, number one, they are confused on who actually owns it. Who's that tithe? I don't know if you guys were here a couple weeks ago, but you know, we'll, talk, we'll talk about it here in a little bit. But he said, listen, he said, you rob me when you hold back my tithe. We can't rob God if we're holding back something that belongs to us. 
But he says, but when we hold that to tithe, he calls us a thief. Why? Because he says that, that tithe is mine. He says, that's the God portion. And you're holding it back and you're robbing me. So number one, Brad, they're confused with who actually owns that. Number two, they're also confused on when they step out of faith and they give that seed and they sow that seed. They're confused on who it benefits. So there's a lot, we have a lot, this is a family church, and there's a lot of times that we got, you know, my dad, you know, Uncle Roddy up here, uh, who, who, who's the, uh, the senior pastor of this church, and I can't tell you how many times I said, babe, make sure you, make sure, babe, make sure you pay our tithes and our offering, you know, I, I know dad really needs it, you know, hey, make sure, don't, don't forget, babe, that, that we give us something in the offering, offering plate, I know Uncle Roddy really needs it, all of a sudden, we're giving offering and tithes to Uncle Ronnie and to Dad and, and to Grandpa. All the, no, no, listen, the, the tithes and the offering, when we are obedient with our time, our talent, and our increase, it rewards you. It has nothing to do about us. It has nothing to do with me. God is such a great and, and wonderful God that there's a side effect, and that side effect is it takes care of the church. But when you give, it blesses you. If you can get into the mindset of, hey, every time I serve, every time I give God, my time, my talent, and my increase, it's always going to bless you. Right. I appreciate you coming to church because it makes me feel good inside. But listen, you need to be coming to church for what it does to you. Exactly right. So I'm going to try to go through this as fast as I can. Uh, so just hang with me. But i got to talk about money, and today I want to talk a little bit about, more about the tithe and the offering. You've got to get to a position where you can manage your resources. You can do what God's called you to do. Next week, I'm going to start talking about managing the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. I don't know if you even know about that. Have you ever experienced him? Perhaps not, because you don't know how to manage such power. God says, before I ever release what I put inside of you, I need to know if you're able to manage it. And so... We'll get there next week. This week we're talking about money. I've learned this, and this is something I've known, and this is not Bible. It's just true. Money is a medium of exchange. Money has no identity of its own. Um, money takes on the identity of what we give it. For example, I got a $20 bill laying in front of me. That $20 bill is worth $20 because the economy says it's worth $20. But if they said it was worth nothing, it would be worth nothing. I mean, it really has no identity. It really has no, like, no DNA. But it becomes what, what we want it to become. And if I want this $20 bill to become um, milk, egg, and bread, then all of a sudden this $20 becomes milk, egg, and bread. It, it becomes whatever you need it to be. It has no identity of its own. It takes on the spirit of the one who holds it. This a twenty dollars to you may mean may mean nothing to you, but twenty dollars to me may mean something completely different. Twenty dollars in the hands of the righteous is completely different than twenty dollars in the hands of the unrighteous. Uh -huh. It takes on the spirit of the one who holds it. <laughs> there are people that twenty bucks is not a big deal, or a hundred bucks is not a big deal. But there's other people that would give anything to have an extra hundred dollars. Money is a medium of exchange in Ecclesiastes. And I think it was Solomon. He said money, money answers all things. In other words, money can become the seed for whatever you need it to be. You need gas, money will become the seed for that. You need, you need food, money will become the seed for that. Money, money answers all things. Money can become whatever you need it to be. Now listen, this is, I think this would be more perhaps controversial in the 11 o'clock service. <laughs> but... And if it's okay with you, I might go a little bit after 10.30, if that's okay. I know we had a, had a short start uh, or a late start, but I'm gonna, I'll try to keep this as close to 10.30 as I can. But I, I put this in my notes. I'm kind of thinking, I'm kind of curious to what people will think. I don't believe that you can buy anything from God. You can't afford it. The salvation that you have and the freedom that you have today and the fact that you, you get to die and go to heaven, you could not afford it. Just think what the Lord had to do to buy it. He gave his life. You, I don't know if any of you are giving your life. You're certainly not giving your life for me. But the Bible says that even when he knew you, when you were a sinner, he still came and he died on that cross. You can't buy. You can't buy anything from God. But I believe you can exchange things with God. Let me explain this. Several weeks ago, several months ago probably, we talked about uh, making room for the miracle. Remember that message? And there was a story in the Bible how there was a, um, a Shunammite woman. And she said, listen, she said, every time, every time this prophet comes by, he's traveling by, he comes by. She said, she looked at her husband and she said, let's, let's make him a room. 
let's make him a room upstairs. And so they go upstairs and they transform that room. And, and if you go read your text, they, they literally said they gave him a bed and they gave him a table and they gave him a, a nightstand and a lamp. They really made a room for him. And so when he came to town, they said, listen, every time you're in town, prophet, man of God, come stay in our house. And so he did. And in response to that, in response to that, the prophet said, now what can I do for you? And she said, really? She said, well, I would love to have a baby. And he said, this time next year, you will have a baby. She couldn't buy that baby, but she exchanged obedience to the prophet. She exchanged a bedroom for a baby. You can't buy things from God, but you can make exchanges. Uh, several weeks ago, we were talking about how God is a God of position, you know, take the position of deliverance. And we're talking about how Jehoshaphat, how three vast armies were after him. And he said, uh-oh, I've got to find victory over these three vast armies. He didn't go pay money to God. What he did was is he resolved to inquire of the Lord. He went and he worshiped and he fasted. And, and, and in exchange for that, the Lord brought him victory. God, I need this, and so what? In order for me to get this, I want to go worship you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna seek your face, and I'm gonna fast, and, and I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna make an exchange. Money answers all things. It has nothing to do, uh, uh, has nothing to do with you. You give it the identity, though, but it becomes whatever you want it to become. And because of that, because I know that we can't buy anything from God, but we can make exchanges from God. You better believe that if there ever comes a time where I put an offering or a tithe in this basket, you better believe I'm telling the Lord uh, what I'm exchanging that for. Now, I know I can't buy a healing from God, but I can say, Lord, remember, listen, money has no identity. You give it its identity. It answers all things. Lord, listen, I can't buy a, a healing from you. But I'm going to respond to you out of obedience. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. And Lord God, I'm going to step out of faith. And I'm going to be obedient to you. And Lord, in return, I need a healing. I don't know if that's ever been preached before. And, and Lord God, I'm going to always put you first with my time, my talent, and my increase. And what I need from you is peace of mind. I need to know that you're going to fight my battle. I'm going to wake up in the morning and seek you and worship and read my word and grow and develop. In exchange, I need you to do this for me. In the new year, we're going to do a 21-day fast. And we'll talk more about this as we get closer. But, a but when you fast, I'm telling you, man, it makes a big difference. Uh, uh, a lot, most of you guys know the story about Ashley and I in our separation. And it was just the most traumatic time of my life. And we're very, we're very transparent with it because uh, we know our, our story inspires other people. And there are a lot of people that, that go through that. We want them to know that they can talk to us about it. But literally for years afterwards, I still suffered with it. I really suffered with it. And uh, I, got, I got serious. And uh, Jensen Franklin is just a guy that we like to follow. His church does a 21-day fast. And I was following him on face, uh, on, on his um, I, um uh, I have a Facebook or whatever. I was listening to them on, online, and um, uh, and they, you know, I just so happened to be along with them when they were when they were doing their twenty one day fast. And so I joined them as if it was my church. I joined them in the twenty one day fast, and I sat down. And I know you cannot buy from God, but you can make exchanges. I sat down at my work during my lunch period with my notebook and a book that I was reading, and I wrote out my prayer to God. I said, Lord God, I'm sitting right now. I, I marked the date. I'm fasting for 21 days, and Lord, I need this in return. I need deliverance. I need to be healed from this. I need to find freedom. This is why I'm doing this. Money has no identity of its own, but it answers all things. And what we're able to do is we're able to come in and say, Lord God, I know that you, look, God, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, God doesn't care about your money. He walks on things that we want to carry around our neck. The Bible says in heaven, the streets of gold, he's walking on stuff that we want to put on our finger. Money has never been an issue to God. The Bible says that he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. In other words, that dude never goes without. He's the creator of all things. You know, he doesn't need our money, but what he wants is he wants your heart. We talked about that. There's a rich young ruler in the Bible, and, 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 the, um, and the Lord told him, he said, go sell everything that you have. It, 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 was, it wasn't the fact that God was mad at him, that he was wealthy, but it was the fact that this rich young ruler was more tied to his riches than he was tied to God. He said, you got to go get rid of this because I want your heart. I don't care about your money. I want your heart. But the truth is, is a lot of times 
our heart is tied to right next to our money. Because we go slay that work. We go, we go pay our dues for 40 hours a week, if not more. You know, we're just we're just working and working and we're tired and we're depleted and our back hurts and our knees hurt and our hands hurt. And so the Lord says, listen, you went and you gave, you you basically gave all of you for that paycheck. I know that you're tied to you're you're tied to that. So I want you to I want you to be obedient and respond to me and, and, and give me my God portion. Not because I want your money, but because I want your heart. That's right. I want your heart. Money isn't tainted. I know a lot of people want to talk about the evilness of money. Money isn't tainted. Money isn't evil. Money takes on money takes on the spirit of the one who owns it. Listen, I know this is kind of unsettling for some people, but that fifty dollars in your purse or your wallet today may go to lunch after church here. I, I'm thinking that's. I think Ashley's going to call me and say pick up some Chipotle on the way home. So that fifty dollars that I have, or that twenty dollars that I have, may go to. To lunch, but listen, that may have gone that, that same fifty dollar bill, the same one that's in your pocket today, may have gone down in a drug deal two weeks ago. There's a spirit that, that goes on to this money, and I can't control what you do with your money, and I can't control what the other person did with this fifty bucks before it came into my life. But now that this is in my life, it had no identity before, but it came in my life, and I'm going to give it an identity. I'm going to give it its own DNA. And right now, that fifty dollars that was unholy before is holy now. I'm going to use this money to further the kingdom. I'm going to use this money to buy more coffee mugs to give them away to our visitors. That's what it's going to do. That's going to take on the spirit of me. That's right. And that's why I think God should give me more money. I'm dead, I'm dead serious. God, I want you to take care of me. Because when that comes into my hand, I'm telling you, I remain faithful right. through thick and thin. When my wife will walk out of me, I remain true. When the church was falling apart, oh, that's not really true, but I remain true. When I questioned my calling, I never doubted. When everybody was leaving, I stayed. I'm faithful. There's never been a time in my life that I've not honored God with my time and my talents and my increase. So, Lord God, I have proven my worth to you. I have proven that I'm disciplined enough. I have proven that I'm holy enough and righteous enough, so give me more of what you got. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. Let's talk about the tithe really fast. You have, it's really fast. Let's talk about the tithe really fast. I mean, I, I know I've said this before, but it's just out of this world how I have, I'm a horrible talker.